natural conclusional soil in this case, which is built to maintain even development of shear resistances, um, localized shear softening, and progressive failure. This is exactly the same problem that we have with some geosynthetic imitations, where the shear deformation response is brittle and you can induce progressive failure. This happens with the soils as well. Leachate buildup in old unlying waste fills can reduce slope stability. Factors of safety contribute to the development of unstable slope conditions. They need to be monitored. So that was the case here. And operational activities uh, may reduce slope stability, such as filling above the permitted heights and slopes. So the, the root cause of this failure was lack of recognition of the shear strength of the colloidal soil underlying the cell, the high, for, the high uh, liquid levels in the cell, and the overfilling. Those three things together led to the failure. And like many failures, it's not one factor that often is the root cause for the failure. So what did we learn by the mid-1990s? We learned a lot of things, and I just summarized what I think are 12 of the important lessons here. The first one, perhaps the most important, don't forget fundamental soil mechanics. It's amazing, you know, on some of these case studies how people didn't just go back to those principles. Waste materials have geotechnical properties that must be characterized. We saw that in the main failure. Liquid and gas conditions in the, in the fill are important. They can create elevated pore pressure. We saw that in two of the case studies. Soil and geosynthetic interface strength must be characterized, both peak and residual. Mobilized strain compatibility is often an issue. We have materials with much different shear deformation behavior that we need to consider. Because of that, progressive failure mechanisms must often be considered. Time-dependent stage loading response must be addressed at soft soil sites. Numerous interim waste configurations often require assessment. Some of these facilities will operate for 20 years. Is it sufficient to just evaluate the final configuration of the facility, or should you be evaluating the interim configuration? <coughs> and. Um, Operating conditions in the field often deviate from the design. Surface cracking and toe bulging may be signs of incipient failure. That's true of earth structures as well, obviously. Communications between the engineers and operators are critical. So we learned a lot. And in fact, I got invited in 1995. Uh, I think it was an ASCE uh, conference called Geo Environment 2000, but it was in 1995. Um, I was asked to write about the state of the art for landfill design. I, ba I basically said at one point, with respect to stability, we know what we're doing. Um, and that was that was a bit that was a bit um, a bit of hubris. Is that the word? Um, because we can fast forward. So the second half of this talk is entitled "Continuing Challenges." So we're going to look at some things from the current decade. But maybe a more apropos name than continuing challenges is why do we keep having all these waste fill failures? And in fact, in the current uh, decade, uh, there have been a large number of really significant failures, more than, more than one a year. And you'll notice now a lot of these are listed as confidential. And um, all those confidential entries are facilities that we value to the landfill owner. And the landfill owner doesn't want us to name the facility and try to keep it out of the press. So I've, I've got a figure. If we, you know, if we know about all these failures, let's pick another some, maybe Golder, for example. They probably they probably even value at least more failures. So this, you know, this should be this should be considered a partial list. But I'm going to do the same thing I did for the first half of the talk. I'm going to pick three facilities and show uh, a little bit about what occurred in each and see what lessons we learned and then come to some uh, observations and conclusions. But at this point in the talk, I also want to make this point um, about, you know, I'm talking mo here mostly about landfills and landfills in the U.S. But the problems and the challenges of landfills around the world and particularly in developing countries make the challenges we have in developing companies, offering these facilities, run engineers, reporting on open dumps, the capital.
catch on fire, a lot of work was set, you know, there's no stability analysis being done. Sadly, um, poor communities will often develop mass proofs for the landfill because they see it as a resource for scavenging. And it's then when a failure happens, and these are all recent failures, people die, dozens of people, I don't know if it's reached hundreds, but it's not uncommon, two or three times a year. I mean, see, there's some case studies about um, uh, a large number of people dying in terms of um, preventable um, situations. And I also want to make the point that it's not just landfill. The, uh, you know, we've had some real challenges over the past five, 10 years with, in the Eastern US, coal combustion residual impoundment failure. This is the uh, TVA Kingston facility. And this is, uh, you might have heard, the two tower dams ever site. And then we think, I think probably some of the folks in this audience know about pine cavern failures. And I'll probably, a couple years back in the Canada and earlier this year, the uh, Valley Mining uh, failure at Bunzino in, uh, in uh, Brazil that killed about 350 people. So the point is, it's not just a US problem, it's a global problem. It's not just you know, the solid waste or hazardous waste. It's really all kinds of industrial byproducts. And, and the question might be, why are we seeing so many failures of different types? So coming back to the three uh, case studies I'm going to briefly talk about, this first one is a, a waste mass and what I'll call intermediate cover cell failure in the eastern U.S. and it occurred in 2011. We see the landfill here. We see um, the area that fell here. This is the Toa Slope. So this is all natural ground. You can see that this waste material flows about 500 feet beyond the Indian landfill. So we got a call right after the failure to come out and uh, help the owner investigate what had happened. And this is important. Like, all of these areas were built exactly the same as this area. So if this, if this area failed, um, are, are, are these areas at risk of failure? At the time of the failure, the waste filling had recently been completed in a landfill expansion over an original landfill. So think about there being an original landfill filling this site, and the owner wants to get more capacity. So what they do is they go right to the edge here, and they extend the liner 100 feet. And then they, they fill this wedge of waste up over the entire facility, 100 feet wide. Well, if it's a 200 acre facility, you have this 100 foot wide wedge, 190 feet high. That's a lot of additional capacity and a lot of additional revenue for the owner, and that's what they did. Um, important to this landfill is that it was very wet. So they, they recirculated leachate, basically, Leachate recirculation is a process where, you, if you remember the leachate collection system I showed in one of those first slides, you take leachate out, you pump it out, you send it to a, a water treatment, a wastewater treatment plant. In this case, they took it to the top and re-injected it into the top of the landfill. So why, why would you do that? Two reasons. One, the re-injection actually stimulates microbial uh, decomposition of the waste, so you generate your gas more fast, more quickly, and you can pull it out and do things with it. The other is, you have an avoided cost. You're not treating the wastewater. And this wastewater is pretty nasty, so you can avoid treating it if there's some significant failure. They also um, did not, I won't go into the details of why, but they didn't have good practices with a lot of the rainfall that fell on this site. This is a wet part of the country, purple in terms of this waste mass. Finally, they accepted the water and sewage sludge um, uh, at this facility. And this is an interesting this side comment. So in the past seven, eight years, landfills have started uh, accepting food sludges. And one of the reasons is the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009 in recycling. Take those two things together. It drove down the demand for airspace at the commercial landfills. The owners wanted to make up the lost capacity, so they started accepting alternative waste streams, one of them being sewage sludge. And it turns out that this is a major problem. <clears throat> Failure occurred in the expansion area, again, in this veneer, over a matter of minutes, involved about 150,000 feet of material that um, 
investigation showed that the subsurface was between this veneer and the intermediate cover layer, soil cover layer, over the original length. Remember me showing you that intermediate cover layer in that first slide or so? This lightning occurred on, on that interface. We went out and did a bunch of CEP testing after the failure, around the perimeter of the failed area, and found that the slopes had very high piezometric levels. There's a lot of pressure above water in, in the slopes. Obviously, one of the root causes. On site observations the day after the slide revealed leakage pools and gas vents within the failure area, clearly evidence of a wet, pressurized fill. So, this, this had an active gas, this an active gas collection system that had been shut down for a month because of malfunction. And, you know, so you think about all this water, all this gas, if you have a very wet, landfill, it's, it's just like if you have a saturated soil, gas can't squeeze through it. So you're generating gas, it's trying to expand and move in this waste, in this wet waste tank, and it's, it's creating pressures within the fill. And that's reflected in, in the distance that the material flows, it's liquefied. So this obviously is a cross section to this other area. The dark brown is the original landfill, here's the liner. This is the, the 100 foot extension that I talked about. And then over 18 months, this veneer of waste was placed and filled. Now, another challenge with this landfill, it was very wet, but the conditions were exacerbated by the owner because he left, or she left, the uh, intermediate cover soil in place, and this was low permeability. So basically, there was a, a liner, not a very good liner, but a liner um, at the bottom of this expansion area. And so leachate in this area couldn't drain down to the original leachate collection system. And there was no drainage layer put on the back um, of this slope to collect this liquid and maybe convey it down to the cell and get it out of the fill doing that. So really pretty substantial emission in hindsight. And this just shows the same um, uh, cross section with uh, the uh, survey results for the limits of the waste after the flow. So you clearly get a sense that the material is very wet, it's liquefied, and it travels a lot of distance. So uh, as part of the evaluation, we conducted flowability analyses using CPT derived piezometric levels and the location of the failure surface that we observed in the field. The back analyses resulted in a drain waste friction angle of about 0.6 factor safety of one. At the same time, we collected samples of the waste material, which we estimated to be about 75% MSW and 25% flood, and sent them to Ed Cavazanjan at Arizona State University from the next in NOAA. He's got a big 18-inch diameter uh, direct shear box that he uses for, for waste. In fact, we built it while he was at the Syntec, and we invited him to take it to Lynch, Arizona State. Um, and he came up with friction angles in the range of 24, 23 in phase one, uh, normal stress. We can compare those to um, typical drainage from the waste in 1975. I wrote a paper on the topic and suggested a friction angle, typical friction angle for waste of about 33 degrees with small cohesion. And others have come out since, since then with other recommendations, but typically it's in the 33, 35, 36 degree range. So, a fairly strong material um, for comparison <coughs> value, and we believe that these lower strains reflect the presence of the um, sludge and possibly uh, lower the composition of the waste material itself. So, some lessons learned from this case study excessive leachate recirculation and stormwater infiltration can lead to buildup of elevated liquid levels and more pressure from the waste. Vertical expansions that involve the placement of new waste overall, the placement of this veneer, need to account for the interface conditions. In this case, the low permeability intermediate cover impacted leachate percolation down to the original fill. So either that, that layer needs to be stripped off before doing the expansion, or perhaps even better, a new drainage layer needs to be placed on top of it, specifically for the expansion layer. 
Gas collection efficiency can be greatly reduced in excessively wet landfills. Those with operational problems, you have a lot of water that's keeping gas flow water out and you can't, you can't pour gas out of them. By the reduction of gas permeability, it increases levels of waste gas, which again behaves just like soil when it's dry. And the effects of sludge on the strength, permeability, and degree of saturation of the waste must be accounted for design. In this case, we believe it degraded the properties of the waste material. This next case study, a little different, is in the southern US. And this is a waste mass and foundation failure. This is obviously the slope that fell that's about 90 feet high, 95 feet high, with a four to one inclination. Not very big for a steep rise landfill standard. You can see the back dark uh, other side and the robin that was formed um, in the direction in which you can see it was very central from east to west. So this landfill cell was constructed in deep excavation into a very heavily over-consolidated native tax clay. So deep excavation into over-consolidated tax clay. The excavation occurred in 1996, which came borrowed slow for other things going on at the site. Liner construction didn't begin until 2007. So for a decade, this excavation stood open on the water in the bottom. So <clears throat> think about that a little bit. Yeah, this site was underlain by a liner system that wasn't involved in the failure. So not Waste milling occurred from mid-2007 to early-2009, so fairly quickly over 18 months, creating the flow of credits that I mentioned a moment ago. The failure involved a trans translational movement um, over a period of several days, and it occurred in 2012, three years after filling was substantially completed. So this was not you know, an undrained failure. This did not occur at the end of construction or at the end of filling. You see here um, the cell. This is the limit of the cell here. Uh, it moves in this direction. Here's the head start. It's about 1,000 feet long, 50 feet deep. Movement was about 25 feet in this direction. There was, there was a tow burn here, but this excavation I mentioned actually extended out into this area. So other than a tow burn, there was really no buttressing on uh, this side of the fill. So you had that slope and it just translated into the adjacent potential cell here. You can see the folding of the material here. For scale, this is flooding. This is water construction equipment. The first signs of a problem occurred three months prior to the failure when north south oriented cracks were observed at the eventual location of the head start to apply. So, what do people do when they get cracks in their slope? They fill them. And what happens when you fill the cracks? Inevitably, they reopen with time, typically after rain events, and that was, that was the case here. The slide involved a translational movement of about 700,000 cubic yards of waste in soil, a distance of about 25 feet. And this was kind of a slow, compared to the others, kind of a slow movement over a period of days, not a, a fast movement. The forensic investigation that we conducted concluded that the failure mechanism involved shallow translational movement in the native clay about five feet below the bottom of uh, the land system. We were asked to come out and investigate this failure. Unfortunately, we, didn't, we weren't invited to come out until some number of months after the failure. A lot of important data was installed. So, for example, we installed a number of pedometers. It was limited in number. Um, it was about five months after the failure, and the owner didn't want us punching holes in pedometers down through the failed cell because there was a belief that the liner system kind of loaded the cell and um, that they could have a remedy for the site that wouldn't involve having to remove all this material and rebuild the cell and do other things and leave that liner system in place, which was going to be intact. 
So uh, they were reticent for us to, to um, um, uh, unfold in the line. So we did, we did the, the reason for that story is we didn't have good pedometer distribution. So they actually started in the vicinity of the story. So uh, we had to deal with that. We did get a lot of high quality uh, soil samples and conducted a fairly robust uh, laboratory analysis. We evaluated uh, peat, blue softened, and uh, residual shear strains and uh, solidation characteristics and other things. And just to show you a few of the results, these are posional rain shear tests to evaluate the residual strains of the mineral clay. These are the uh, linear, linearized uh, failure envelopes we have for uh, our analysis. We're looking, we're looking at normal stress ranges of the nutrients for the material. And so for the residual strains, we characterize it with friction angle of 6.7 degrees, the very small cohesion. For the fully softened strains, 13.1 um, degrees, the small cohesion as well. We'll talk about that number in just a second. So without Without um, good uh, hydrometer data, we, we did a couple things. We conducted some consolidation analysis to see what we thought the pore pressure increases from G might be just based on consolidation of the clay and the weight of the weights. And we actually concluded that it was probably pretty close to hydrostatic. But this is the interesting part. Hydrostatic with respect to creating the leachate collection removal system, which is one five feet above the failure surface of the drainage. So um, that was our thinking, and it was uh, it was one of the lines of evidence we used in concluding what the likely pore pressures were. The other thing we did was try to get some insight on pore pressures by doing the back analysis, and we reasoned that after this uh, slope had moved 25 feet, the native clay material was clearly at its residual strength value with that much movement, and so we could take that uh, post failure geometry after the 25 feet. And the factor safety is one, uh, four factor safety is one, and the residual strength we got from the test results we tried to calculate a poor pressure coefficient, the number of poor pressure coefficient. So we did that. We calculated an RU of 0 0.14. And, and that's that seemed that seemed pretty well aligned with what we would have expected from consolidation analysis. We then did a second set of analysis with the uh, pre-failure geometry. Towards the moon 25 feet, we used the same pore pressure coefficient, and we calculated an operative strength uh, for uh, the material at the start of failure of 10.6 degrees, which um, is shown in the slide here. So we can see we can see that we think at the start of failure, the strength of the material is somewhere in this range here, less than the fully softened strength is above the residual strength. So putting it all together, um, that the decade-long open excavation allowed the ponded water to infiltrate the native clay through desiccation cracks of inside and by uh, native <coughs> water, and water in, um, resulting in softening of the clay and a fully softened shear strength in the, in the shallow zone of that native material through deep breathing activity. And then, as the uh, landfill was filled on top of this zone, uh, it induced uh, uh, stresses that resulted in shear deprivation in the material. It induced progressive strain loss, taking past its fully softened strain to a point where factor safety is reduced to about one in the material detail. So I'm only, I'm only going to really have one lesson learned from this case study, and it's the same one that was learned 25 years ago. <coughs> Geotechnical fundamentals matter. In this case, the consolidated plastic clay swelled and softened due to unloading and access to water, resulting in fully softened shear strain conditions, followed by progressive failure due to the shear stresses imposed by the clay swell. We were talking about uh, comprehensive exams for PhDs today. This might this might be an interesting um, one for students to figure out, try to figure out what caused the failure. Last case study, I think this is a relatively quick one, was a waste mass failure in uh, 2007 17 in the Northeast US. And you can see it's snowy in this instance. 
move forward to grow and grow a sense of uh, scale as we track the trail of about 30 million. So, in 2017, about 15 acres of this, um, this landfill uh, failed, and sadly it resulted in a worker fatality. In the weeks leading up to the failure, the owner of the facility observed all kinds of things that were a tip off to um, the fact that there were problems. These include surface cracking on the slopes, sl bulging of the slopes, leachate seeps, and gas venting out of cracks in the landfill. And the owner tried to do things to fix those, but there couldn't be too, too little too late. Failure occurred quickly again over about 10 minutes, starting with the bursting of these bulging faces, which triggered a larger slide, releasing nearly 100,000 cubic yards of material that flowed several hundred feet beyond the limit of the liner system. You see, you see the red shows the limit of the failure area. The actual scene of the failure was um, right in this area here, and it retrogressed all the way back here, and it ran out a large distance that this is in here, along here. And you can see that it actually, the movements were actually in two directions, like this and like this. And you'll see why in the next slide. So the area where this failure occurred again involved um, an expansion over an older part of the landfill with an intermediate cover between them. This wasn't a veneer, it was a large area, but again, it, it had this intermediate cover layer. The intermediate cover um, consisted of cuttings from oil and gas drilling operations. This was in Marcellus Shale country. And so they drill cuttings and so they mixed them with lime and they laid it down into this intermediate cover, which created a hard, smooth, and relatively impermeable material. And as was the case in the earlier case study, when they placed the next cell against the previous cell, they didn't remove this layer, nor did they put in the drainage layer. So um, the problem that was repeated from the earlier study. In addition to MSW, the landfill accepted a variety of special waste, including sludge described as low shear strength waste. It's a telling name. The operations plan for the landfill required this low shear strength waste to be placed 100 feet back from the edge of the landfill to prevent leachate seeps from maintaining stability. So think of, you know, like a solid waste buttress um, with the sludge, the low shear strength material being placed back. So you would say, that's a good idea. Yeah, that makes sense. They're, they're trying to do things right. Um, the problem is that the setback limited the area of the cell that you could place this low shear strength waste. Basically, what turned out is that it took all of the municipal solid waste to build this 100 foot buffer zone, and there wasn't enough municipal solid waste to mix with the sludge in the area behind this zone. You can see that here. So, this is the red line we saw in the previous slide. Um, this is the uh, edge of the slopes that fell. And you can see there's like a 90 degree, almost a 90 degree angle here. So their idea was all of this would be pure solid waste, and then they'd mix sludge and solid waste back here. But the forensic investigation showed, you know, relatively high concentrations in these brown areas of sludge back here, which would be indicative of a, a zone of low strength. So basically, a good idea that had unintended consequences. So I tried something new, a good idea, but unintended consequences. While the landfill only accepted about 20% low shear strength waste, these zones in brown uh, had 40% or more of that material in them. So why is that important? Well, because of the shear strength nature. We collected representative samples of both municipal solid waste and low shear strength waste and sent them to Colorado State University to uh, Chris Barreifer and Joe Scalia, who uh, did direct shear testing uh, in a 12 inch diameter apparatus that they have. Um, please don't hold me against you. <laughs> <laughs> the 
the testing uh, was conducted at a whole range of uh, mass fractions of MSW versus low shear strength weights. And what we found is that at about 40% um, low shear strength weight or more, the shear strength uh, really dropped up that way. This is the, the shear strength one that I mentioned earlier that Ed Kevin Jenkins and I came up with back in 95. And here are some of the results for low concentrations of, of low shear strength weight. And then at high concentrations, you can see how low the strength gets. So this was clearly one of the root, root causes of uh, this failure. So some lessons learned here. Special wastes can create operational problems. Procedures developed to mitigate the problems can have unintended consequences. We saw that here. Special wastes are placed at too high a concentration. And if not thoroughly mixed with other materials, um, can create low shear strength zones that adversely affect stability. And finally, low permeability zones in the waste, i.e. from either the special waste with reduced permeability or the intermediate covered soil layer. And other things I didn't talk about as we did here made it really hard for liquids to drain out of these cells. So again, we see a condition where the leachate, leachate wasn't draining out and both liquid and gas pore pressures were building. So, a few thoughts, observations, and recommendations in light of these, um, these failures, and, and then I'll wrap up. First, um, we're, we're relearning all the lessons that we learned 25 years ago. Um, and I thought a lot about, you know, why, why is that? Is it um, that each generation of engineers needs to learn, you know, things for themselves? We don't carry, we're not good at carrying lessons from one, you know, one generation to another. Is it um, that uh, people perceive this as a mature area of practice and it's not getting the attention it needs? Is it that um, the owners of these facilities aren't willing to invest to make sure things are done right? Probably some combination of all those things. But clearly, uh, we're seeing we're seeing a lot of the same problems that we saw in the years ago. And then, in terms of newer things, things that are more recent, these relate to leachate recirculation, which can saturate the waste and cause high piezometric levels in the waste. That these very wet landfills, um, gas collection efficiency and gas permeability of the waste mass go way down. So we're seeing facilities where um, gas pressures are building way up. And as another consequence, I didn't talk about it today, in these very wet facilities with high gas pressures, we're seeing in some cases temperatures in these landfills of 250 to 300 degrees. So, I mean, I don't think we would want to be hanging around that facility. Um, Co-disposal of sludges and special waste can lead to stability problems. We saw that. And vertical expansion configurations that contributed to waste failure. So we need to be cognizant of that. And I've got lessons uh, learned or, or recommendations, rather, for each of these. I'm not going to go through them. I will say, I just submitted this lecture to ASCE for a potential publication. So hopefully um, it'll be published and there'll be more detail about these things and the recommendations. I, I want to finish up with this plot and, and just make, this is the last slide, make, just make a few comments about the standard of care in this 